Good evening. This is Crime Classics. I am Thomas Highland. I'm going to tell you another true crime story. Listen. The man is nailing a horse's picture to the wall. The horse is pawing the western skies in the classic attitude of pawing horses, and it is the top half of a calendar distributed by Isaac's livery. It's a hot April day in St. Joseph, Missouri, in the year 1882, and the man is hanging the picture in his living room because he has a fondness for the noble beast. Horses have got him out of many a critical situation, such as one, holding up railroads, two, robbing banks, three, murdering fellows. His name is Jesse James, and as soon as he finishes hanging that picture, a friend of his is going to shoot the back of his head off. So tonight, my transcribed report to you on the death of a picture hanger. Crime Classics, a new series of true crime stories taken from the records and newspapers of every land from every time. Your host each week, Mr. Thomas Highland, connoisseur of crime, student of violence, and teller of murders. Now, once again, Thomas Highland. Tonight, we take you to Jefferson City, Missouri, to the mansion of the governor of that state. His name was Crittenden, but his cronies called him Critch. He liked living in the governor's mansion because he never had it so good. There were servants, crystal chandeliers, wine furnished by cronies, entertainments by cronies, and best of all, six small gilded cherubs, backs bent cheerfully to support a cast iron bathtub, and quite often the governor also. So, if you've never attended a governor taking a bath, here's your chance. Uh, where's that soap? Where is it? Oh, there it is, Critch. Uh, right behind you. Uh, sir. Uh-huh? Uh, when's the last time you had a bath? Uh, Kansas City. Just after the hanging of Billy Bob Williams. Let's see, that was, uh... March 12th, last. <laughs> what a memory you got, Governor. Yeah, hanging outlaws is one of the nicest parts of this job, General Lake. <laughs> you ever get to be Governor, hang a lot of outlaws and remember when. That way you can tell people and people will be impressed and keep you Governor. <laughs> I'll remember. Uh, hand me that rose water and glycerin, sir. Oh, sure. Uh, oh, yeah. Thanks. Hmm. <clears throat> Uh, you you know what I called you down here for? Got an idea. Tell me, and I'll tell you if you're right. Jesse James? Mm. Look good on my record. He to die somehow soon. During my administration in my state. People will cheer you wherever you go. They like the sound of people cheering. Governor. Uh, Henry, the towel, sir. Oh. Uh, thanks. Governor, I've been thinking. Scheming kind of thinking? Oh, you might say. About Jesse? If it works, people are able to cheer you right on to Washington. <laughs> then there's no telling what. In a case like that, you're liable to be standing right where I'm standing. That's right. Get Jesse for me. I'm going to do that. Not since Kansas City, huh, Sheriff? Not since then. Well, how'd you like to take a bath right now? I didn't want to say nothing. I uh, I was hoping you'd ask. <laughs> She's all yours, Sheriff. Enjoy yourself. <laughs> Timberlake was a man who instinctively knew his way around a bathtub. He soaked, lathered, and rinsed, and was out of there in the shake of a lamb's tail. Then he went home. Then he changed his clothes. He got into a nondescript outfit of brown woolen pants and a black alpaca coat, and he went down to Kansas City. Many things were to be found in Kansas City. 
a wooden monument, long since burned, of Daniel Sanker, who got a message through to his beleaguered dad, a grand opera house, and three mechanical pianos, each with fiddle attached. All in all, it was a very happy community. Worthy of note is the fact that Spit in the Ocean, a poker variation, was invented at Bobrick's Poker Palace during this era. And it is into this very den that Sheriff Timberlake wandered. He wandered here because he was looking for someone. A girl. A young lady whose job it was to stand in back of strangers at the gaming tables and make signals to the houseman on the opposite side. When Timberlake approached her, she had three fingers in the air and the tip of her tongue pointing to the left. Maddie. Oh. Up to you, honey. Want to talk with you, Maddie? A second. Raise you. Carl. I got me a one-eyed jack in the hole. Gives me three of them. Where'd you say you're from? Roanoke? Nice place. Come on. Out here. What you want? How's Johnny? You said you weren't going to turn him in. For favors. What you want him to do? Nothing. What you want? Jesse James. Oh. Got to clean up Missouri, Matty. Oh? Got to start with Jesse. If you say it. Yeah, Jesse's staying with Robert and Charlie Ford. That's right. Now, you're friends, ain't they, Matty, Robert and Charlie Ford? I used to know him pretty good. Ain't hard to talk to old friends, Matty. And you ain't going to touch Johnny, are you? You just tell Robert and Charlie Ford I'm in Stan Pony's boarding house right now. I ain't got a gun either. That all you want me to do? You tell him, Matty. Yeah. Come on in, boys. Well, didn't Maddie tell you I left my guns back in Jefferson City? Just you come on in. Bob, over there. All right. Glad to see you back in Missouri, Charlie. Heard you and Robert were over in Kansas for a while. Heard you're in jail. Heard you killed a man to get out. Glad to see you back in Missouri. Bob, get him. All right. I told you I weren't holding no iron, boys. Making sure. Take your shirt off him, Bob. Now let him go, Bob. How come you ain't holding nothing, Sheriff? Well, now you know what I'm going to say, you believe. Go on back there, Bob, where you was before. All right. Sheriff, you crazy? Let me ask you a question, then you decide. How'd you like a full pardon for what you've done in Missouri, Charlie? Robert, you need never go back into Kansas. You're free to stay here as long as you live. Come and go as you please. Don't have to worry about killing four people in Missouri. Besides, have $10,000. You've been robbing, you've been stealing, you've been killing. You got $10 between you? Both of you, murderers, thieves, scum. I figured you'd do that. I'm glad you did. Because now you're hating yourself. Put your gun back, Bob. Let him run on a little bit more. You like Jesse James, Charlie? Ain't nothing about him I like or don't like. You like Jesse, Robert? Man's talking here, Rob. Wants to know you like Jesse. Do you? <laughs> Once Jesse and Bob had a little fight. Two years ago, Bob was only 19 and Jesse a full-grown man. When Jesse was finished with Bob, Bob got to be a full-grown man. The governor wants Jesse dead or alive. A lot of people do. 
Governor says he'd give both of you a full pardon and $10,000 for Jesse. Ain't no bargain, Jesse being who he is. Gunfighter like he is. And fast like Whatever he is. Whoever do it, would be a hero. People cheer. That'd be nice. What'd you say, Robert? That'd be nice. Ride with the governor. That'd be nice. <laughs> being a hero instead of a running dog. I like that word. Hero? Yeah. Robert? Yeah? Say it. Hero. <laughs> What's the matter? Listen to what I can say. Ten thousand dollars. Well, boys? Jesse James died all of a sudden. Wouldn't take long for you to hear about it. We'd let you know. That's a promise. Chain reaction. Governor in bathtub, sheriff in waiting, Matty, the girl card watcher, and the brothers Ford, Robert, and Charlie. The principals involved in getting Jesse James assassinated. It would be well at this point to remark upon some of the accomplishments of Jesse James. His standard feat was murdering cowboys and rustling cattle. One incident in Star County, Texas, had him murdering single-handedly three cowboys and driving off 500 fine head of beef a record which stands to this day. On record, too, is his slaying by Bowie Knife of Mr. John W. Wicker, a Pinkerton man from Chicago. Then there were several train robberies, outstanding of which was the one five miles east of Council Bluffs, where he and his men derailed the Chicago, Rock Island, and Pacific Express. The cars telescoped. The engineer was instantly killed. Twelve passengers were seriously injured. And Jesse and his men... Robbed them all. There are many other mayhems too numerous to mention, except that they averaged 1.37 corpses per exploit. One act of kindness must be noted, however. Mr. Avery Thompson, hurt grievously by a runaway horse in the streets of Abilene, pleaded to be put out of his misery. From 50 paces, Jesse obliged. His act of mercy was applauded by all around. It was then this half-kind, half-renegade person that the brothers Ford were going to kill. Charlie and Robert went home, lit the kerosene lamp, and waited. They didn't have to wait too long. Jesse, come on in. It was a Saturday night when Jesse walked through that doorway in Ray County, and Sunday was his favorite day because he could sleep late. Listening to Crime Classics and your host, Thomas Highland. Tomorrow night, if you're in the mood for still more adventure listening, don't miss 21st Precinct, the program that probes the inner workings of the world's largest police force. 21st Precinct shows you policemen as the human beings they are, exposes their tough grinds, their dangerous careers. Remember, it's Tuesday nights on most of these same stations, presented by CBS Radio. And now, once again, Thomas Highland and the second act of Crime Classics and his report to you on The Death of a Picture Hanger.
night Jesse James walked into the Ford home, he was carrying a 45 Colt on one hip, 45 Smith Wesson on the other, and a 44 Derringer in his waistcoat, and a Winchester rifle hung limply from his left hand. Armed in this manner was standard operating procedure for Jesse when he walked into homes, a procedure which varied only some years before when he courted. At this time of romance, he did not wear the Derringer. It should be remarked, however, that the Winchester was kept by his feet like a faithful old dog. All of which adds up to the fact that all of the people who tried before this Saturday night to kill Jesse were long dead. And the Ford boys, Robert and Charlie, were well aware of this fact. But Robert wanted to be a hero. And Charlie wanted $10,000. So they were very hospitable. Sitting in a rocket, yes. Uh, want some whiskey? Bob. Heard you have been in Jefferson City, Jess. Here you are, Jess. Uh, you must be sleepy, Jess. What's the matter with you, Bob? You don't have to tell Jess when he's sleepy. Jess knows when he's sleepy. I just don't Jess... want to talk important things to him, that's all. Not when his head's nothing. Simmer down, Bob. All right, Jess, I'll tell you. We're tired of lazing around. Me and Charlie have been doing nothing, just waiting for you to say go. When are you going to say go, Jess? <laughs> kids anxious, Jess. Just like kids. You're tired, that's all. Yeah. Been on my back like this for a week, Jess. Worrisome, any. Listen, Jess, we figured something. A train, Jess. Trains are easy. You hear what he said? You hear what he said, Charlie? Trains are easy. Kid. The Chicago, Rock Island, and Pacific out of Kansas City. It makes a stop at Winston, Jess. At Cameron, too. Here's your drink, Jess. We're going to do it to the train, Jess? Need some sleep. Bob, fix just that place in the barn. Sure. Sure will. So Bob went out to the barn, fluffed up some straw, and made a bed for Jesse to sleep in. This was considered an act of compassion of the time. Barn owners to wayfarers. But in this instance, it was known as a tactic. Get Jesse on his back in the barn with maybe his guns off. Get him while he's sleeping. So consider now what we have here. Jesse James bedded down for the night and his two would-be assassins as guardian angels. In the trade, this is known as a precarious position. So switch now from prone Jesse to outside the barn. Nearly midnight in Missouri and a mist from the river threading between Charlie Ford... And Bob. When are we going to kill Jess? Try killing him from now on. You think he's sleeping? Where'd you bet him down? Under that window. Well, let's go peek, see if he's sleeping. What you think? He's lying there, all right. Eyes closed? Can't tell. I sure tell this, so. What? Look at that pool of moon. Wait a minute, I'll get out of your way. See? He's holding a gun in each hand. He's a light sleeper. When he sleeps. We don't even know he's sleeping. Charlie. Hmm? Shoot him. Kill him. You want to be the hero, younger brother. You do. This is supposing I miss. I'll shoot you just the way you're standing if you miss. Because if you miss, you wake Jess. And I'll just explain to Jess that I killed you to save his life. I always save in mine. If we were sure he's sleeping, be no trouble at all. You make sure. Yeah, if some kind of animal or something walked by in the soft, that'd be a way. Hey, you were here, man. Come here, you little old dog. That's right. You're too old to live anyhow. Little dog's too old to live 
anyhow, Charlie. Step aside a minute. I'll push him through this chink in the wall. Critter would run into the bar and pass, Jess, and we'll find out for sure. Oh, shit, I like a woman, Bob. Just do it. Bob and Charlie huddled together that night. And in the morning, they flashed their nicest, sleepiest grins when they awoke to find Jesse James standing over them. I shot me this critter last night. Who's going to cook me my breakfast? The boys tumbled out of bed and vied who would be first at the skillet. Bob won, and Charlie put the kettle on. It was late, and it was Sunday, so they had brunch. Toward its end, as a gesture of carefree camaraderie, Jesse heaved the Ford's best china against the wall. Breaking them against the wall is easy, Jess. Why don't you throw them up in the air and shoot them? You crazy, Bob? What would you tell him to do that for? He used up all his bullets and then we... <laughs> Watch it, Jess! <laughs> Ain't gonna hit you, Bob. Just seeing how close I can come. Get in the name of heaven, Jess! Cut it out, Jess. You got the kid almost crying. Stand still. See how you like it, Charlie. See if I can fan your ear without drawing blood. <laughs> <laughs> now let's go do it to a train. Which meant riding down to Winston. Which meant for the Ford boys a constant vigilance for the moment when Jesse would turn his back, would ride ahead of them a few paces. Anything so that they could have an irretrievable advantage. Historians make category of this event as the ride to Winston with the Fords up front. Jesse just didn't trust anybody to ride in back of him, except his mom, but then she was only comfortable on very slow horses. So down to Winston they rode, and at 9.30 p.m. on Monday night, they boarded the Chicago, Rock Island, and Pacific train. As soon as the train started, they dressed themselves in white linen dusters. They wore red handkerchiefs over their faces, and they waited in the vestibule for the conductor. Fifteen minutes later, Jesse James and the Fords left behind them two corpses, a wounded engineer, and an empty duck cage, the boys having released a dozen ducks from the express car. They took with them $8,000 in cash and convertible mementos. The boys jumped off the train at a point where they had tethered their horses. Then they rode south. They rode to St. Joseph, Missouri. They rode to the home of Jesse James, with Jesse riding behind. Wait out here, boys. And... Annie... Don't you kiss me now, Ann. You wait till I wash off this road dust. I don't mind. You're too pretty to get mussed up. Oh, Jess. What you got there, Ann? I was in Isaac's today to see about some harness. He gave me this calendar. <laughs> he said, you put this up in a nice place, Mrs. Howard. Everybody in town calls you Mrs. Howard, don't they, Ann? They call us the Happy Howards. They ask what you do, I say a traveling man. You been traveling, Jess? I brought your watch, Mrs. Howard. Yeah. Why, Mr. Howard, porcelain and gold, just what I wanted. Now you go away, Mark, so I can kiss you. What you doing to that calendar, Jess? Pretty picture of a horse, Ann. Tear off the calendar part, it'll look nice in the parlor. Nail it up in the parlor, Ann. Some tacks and a hammer in the cabinet. Brought the Ford boys with me, Ann. I'll have the boys come in. You make us something to eat. I'll fetch you some water first. I'll wash it. Come on in, boys. You boys like this picture? Right good picture of a horse. What are you going to do with it, Jeff? Figure to hang it here somewhere. I wouldn't want me a picture of no horse in the parlor. You just ain't got no eye. No, he ain't. Yeah, I, I think hanging a picture like that's real good. 
Where are you going to hang it, Jess? Here, I guess. Ah, that's too low to hang a picture. Yeah. Higher, huh? Mm, I had me that picture, and I was going to hang it. I'd hang it higher. Mm, maybe you're right. Pleasant to be home. How's your missus? Pleasant to be home. Man don't have to carry around all these guns weighing heavy around his middle. Feels mighty fine. I said, how's your missus, Jess? Getting water. Gonna cook us something. Get off that chair, Bob. What for? You stupid. I said I was gonna hang me this picture. All right. Pretty picture. Bob. All right. All right, Charlie. Shot the back of Jesse's head off, Bob. That make me a hero, don't it? Sure does. Shooting Mr. Howard, alias Jesse James, in the back was a very heroic deed. So heroic that a song was written about it. The refrain goes, And the dirty little coward, he shot Mr. Howard and laid Jesse James in his grave. In just a moment, Thomas Highland will tell you about next week's crime classic. The Death of a Picture Hanger, tonight's crime classic, was adapted from the original court reports and newspaper accounts by Morton Fine and David Friedkin. The music was composed and conducted by Bernard Herman, and the program is transcribed and directed by Elliot Lewis. Thomas Highland is portrayed on radio by Lou Merrill. In tonight's story, Clayton Post was heard as Jess, Paul Fries as Charlie, and Sam Edwards as Bob. Featured in the cast were Joseph Kearns, Charlotte Lawrence, Paula Winslow, and Joseph Granby. Roy Rowan speaking. Now, here again is Thomas Highland. Next week, a bedroom in Baltimore, Maryland, in June 1871. Its occupant, William Scott Ketchum, Major General, United States Army, retired. My report to you will be on the final day of General Ketchum and how he died. Thank you. Good night. Later this evening, Herbert Marshall has the leading role in a story adapted from Daphne du Maurier's collection called Kiss Me Again, Stranger. It's the eerie story of the birds, describing strange happenings on an otherwise quiet English countryside. Hear it later this evening on most of these same stations when CBS Radio presents The Summer Theater. Yes, later this evening, starring Herbert Marshall. Stay tuned now for Gary Moore with Arthur Godfrey's Talent Scouts, which follows immediately over most of these same stations. And remember, for mystery mixed with merriment, join Mr. and Mrs. North Tuesday nights on the CBS Radio Network. <laughs> 